and welcome back. Now this week we're going to be talking about things AC. As you can see there's a transform at the back, powering a couple of things up. This little breadboard with nothing on it apart from a triac. That's that little thing there. Yes, so they do come in small packages. And um, it sort of relates vaguely to um, a previous video about the workshop heater repair, which I didn't mention at the time. And nobody queried me on it. Why didn't you do such and such? So I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to describe the reasons for doing certain things in that video. And uh, we can experiment here and show you exactly what happens. Now, the circuit board for that workshop heater is this one here. And in this corner, as you can see, there's a little marking saying SCR2. And uh, that was the th uh, the triac, not a thyristor, it was a triac. And it controlled a small motor within the heater that allowed the motor to swivel on its axis. In fact, it looks the motor itself looks like this. There we are, look, that's pretty cheap and it's just it just goes round and round and round, but with a bit of linkage within the motor, the actual motor itself just sort of swivels backwards and forwards like this. You've all seen it in these tower heaters, yeah? Okay, so that um, particular heater doesn't require a lot of current, which is why it wasn't controlled by a heater relay. Um, now, I don't know what the current it is it says it needs. Let's have a look. Oh, look, four watts. So um, by very simple maths, we can work that out, can't we? And so I'm on a 240 main supply here. So that's going to take in the region of between, you know, 16 to 20 milliamps, something like that, to get to 4 watts. So it's trivial. Certainly not worth using a relay for if you can get away with it. But the fact of the matter remains, I didn't use that uh, triac. I connected up the swivel motor to one of the relays. And in fact, for me, logically, the heater now works better than it ever did. But why didn't I use that um, triac then? In fact, it is this very one here, and because uh, I've desoldered it, waste not, want not, as they say. Um, well, there was there was one particular element that I didn't want to do, and um, we're going to discuss that now. And then we're going to talk about triacs in general. Now, normally when we're talking about triacs, we don't talk about little tiny T092 packages like this. We talk about much bigger ones. So something like this which is um, a standard TO220 package where uh, one of the terminals is normally connected to this metal tab. Whether it is on um, triax, I'm not sure. Probably is. Probably T1 or something connected to this. So it could be, could be dodgy. Um, anyway, that's a sort of a power tri uh, triac that can take several amps. Uh, the one we've got down here uh, is uh, a lot smaller. And in fact, the one we've actually got is this one here. It's a 1A60. I can't say I'm particularly familiar with this particular device, but um, as I say, it's in a TO92 package. So this one here and the standard symbol T1, T2 and gate. And if you're familiar with MOSFETs, the gate is exactly the same here as it would be for a MOSFET. This one particularly, if you notice at the top, it says sensitive gate triac. Now that is a bit like a TTL version of a MOSFET in as much that you can drive this directly from a microcontroller because it only needs something like 3 to 4 volts at 5 to 10 milliamps to drive it. In fact, let's have a look down here. So these are the parameters we're after. We're after, first of all, the trigger voltage. I mean, can we actually power this directly from, say, an Arduino or any other microcontroller? And the answer is yes, because if you look down here at the max that you need, um, it's one between 1.8 and 2 volts, depending on depending on what. Oh, these are all little footnotes. Let's not get sidetracked by that. 1.8 to 2 volts, any microcontroller will do that, you know, even a 3.3 version. And the amount of current we need over here is between 5 and 10. So it's not a lot, is it? We can drive this triac directly. And indeed, when you think about it, that's exactly what uh, this board was initially doing. So we have our microcontroller in the middle there, and that was being driven. The gate was being driven. Uh, that center connection there, there's a 
there's a track on the back that goes all the way around through here into, into one of these pins. That was being driven directly from the microcontroller straight into the triac. Now, there's a reason why I didn't use it then, but first of all, let's have a little demo. A picture paints a thousand words and the video gives you an encyclopedia. So let's connect this up and uh, see what happens. Right, I've connected it up and we're using as a power source for the gate of the thyristor, sorry, the triac, um, is a simple LiPo, this one here. We've been through this board before when we were talking about Raspberry Pis. So all that is is giving us a 3.3 volt uh, voltage source, which is going to go via that little resistor there into the gate of this. Let me show you a circuit diagram so we know what's happening. Um, oh, one final thing about this, of course. This, as I was uh, going through the video last time, is obviously a printed circuit board. I chose to use a strip board in my last project because it would have been too long a lead time with the Chinese New Year for me to get a printed circuit board, one of the reasons anyway. So that's why I didn't. And well, now we've spoken about PCBs, I think it's we had a word from our sponsors. PCB way, PCB prototyping the easy way. With more than a decade in the field of PCB prototype and fabrication, they are committed to meeting the needs of their customers. All new member signups get a $5 welcome bonus, and your first prototype order is free. Why not try their online quote system now? Now, let's have a look at the circuit diagram for what I've got on this breadboard. Um, all these big fat resistors here, and that little tiny one, uh, they're just to drop the voltage from the transformer, by the way, because that's a 15 volt output. And uh, what we're driving here, this load here, in fact, is 12 volts so I'm trying to get rid of some excess voltage and the fact we have to use these big fat resistors is because we're talking about an incandescent bulb here yeah I know there's probably some people watching this have never used incandescent bulbs it's all LEDs isn't it these days but just so that there are no other semiconductor um, properties on this circuit we're using a standard heated coil bulb incandescent bulb simple as that right the circuit diagram what does it look like here we are, simple as can be. We have um, our power support supply, so this is our AC supply now, going through the lamp, or indeed in that uh, other video, a motor, to one of the terminals of the triac. Now these are, by convention, T1 at the top, T2 down the bottom, but frankly it doesn't matter if you mix them up because it's bi-directional. Uh, we then have a gate, just like a MOSFET, which is supplied by as we just saw in the data sheet, between 1.8 volts and 2 volts, between 5 and 10 milliamps, and then it all just goes back round again. I mean, it's as simple a circuit as you can get. So let's uh, fire it up. Right, let's fire it up then, then we'll talk about it. Um, this, this wire in my hand here is going to go to this green one just to make the connection so that I'm supplying power now to the gate. And uh, keep your eye on that bulb down here. I think I might reposition that in a minute. Uh, we switch, uh, look, right, so whilst it's on, the bulb's lit. It's not lit very brightly, I have to admit, because um, I'm dropping quite a bit of voltage here, but it's enough to show us what's going on. That at the back we'll come on to in a minute, but this has got absolutely nothing to do with what we're doing here at the minute, just for clarification. Okay, so as long as I, I supply gate power to that triac, power flows, the lamp in this case, but the motor in my heater video goes on, take it off, fine. What's the problem? Well, we're using here a transformer. A transformer is an isolating transformer, as it means I'm isolated from the mains. These two connections at the top are mains, the AC is down the bottom. And I'm doing that for two reasons. One, I didn't really want to play about with mains on this circuit board. As you can see, there's lots of bare wires and it's it's just going to be too risky to do that. So I'm using an isolation transformer with a much lower AC output. But on this board, this board was being driven directly from the mains. Um, the mains came in here, uh, probably via these two capacitors here and uh, resistors, whatever, and produced its, its 5 volts or whatever it needed to run this bit. But the, the neutral, the AC neutral in this corner here, look, if I flip it over, so now it's at the top left, ran across the entire board, and lo and behold, to terminal T2 of that triac you just saw. Okay, And this one here 
was then line input 240 volts. So it went from here through the triac to here as long as there was a gate voltage applied. What did that mean for me? Well, it means that if I was to do the equivalent circuit here and run this board directly from the line input, so this line input here would go in at the top and this neutral connection were to go in down the bottom, it means this line down here would be the neutral line. I would be connecting my circuit up to neutral. I didn't fancy that because although the Arduino Nano I was using would have no effect by being connected up to neutral, its ground would be connected up to neutral. It meant whenever I plugged in a USB cable, of course, into the USB socket on it, it mean I'm connecting up neutral to my PC, which is probably connected to ground anyway at that point, or earth. Possibly. Probably, in fact. It all gets a little bit confusing. I think we need a diagram, really, to, to show what would happen if this was connected up to mains, the incoming mains, without an isolating transformer, and why I didn't want to do it. Just before we look at the, uh, the circuit I've drawn underneath here, bear in mind what I've drawn here, because it's not a million of miles away from that. This was the demo that I've just done for you with a, a transformer here rather than directly to the mains but apart from that it's pretty much the same. So if we now look at uh, what would have happened to my heater design if I'd gone for the triac approach. Here's the triac, here's the motor that was supposed to turn, here's the incoming line voltage, here's the neutral. Here's my little Arduino powered of course by one of these. The 10 star robot. Yes, yes, yes. It's the one that we said would probably blow up in due course, but I used it nonetheless. I've got to try it out somewhere. So this has AC input, but it's an isolated output. So as far as the Arduino is concerned over here, this is running totally independently on its own power supply. This triac needs the power to flow into the gate to turn this on. What's wrong with this circuit diagram, you might think? Well, where is this power going to go? It's coming out of the Arduino through a little limiting resistor into the triac to here. But remember, power from here, this side of the circuit, is trying to get back to this side of the circuit, specifically this ground. Where is it going to go? And the answer is nowhere. This, as it's drawn here, would not work. I would have had to have joined this neutral line all the way across to ground. Now the power from the Arduino can flow through the resistor into the gate of the triac back down to here and here. Fine, it has a circuit, but of course we've now connected the neutral to my Arduino. Ground. Now of course there's a USB socket on here, as I've just said, which means the shield of that USB socket is undoubtedly connected to the ground of the Arduino, but it's now also connected to the neutral of incoming mains. And that's where I'm getting a little bit, hmm, I don't think I like that. I don't know what the impact is going to be by having neutral connected to my ground here. Additionally, of course, this ground inside my PC might well be connected to actual physical earth. What's the problem with that? Well, if you think about what's happening to the line input here, and this is typical across the world, it's not just UK, you have your line and neutral, and they go way back to some substation somewhere, some transformer, to provide you with whatever voltage you get in your part of the world. Okay, now in my part of the world, this would be 240, but it's probably different where you are. And the neutral and the line is sent out by the substation. The neutral line, rather unintuitively, is also connected to earth. They literally put a huge big metal stake into the ground, quite deep, and connect the neutral to the earth. And if this is quite a long line here, they keep connecting it to earth at various stages along the line. Sometimes in older properties, this even gets connected to earth inside your meter as it comes into the house, would you believe? 
Yeah, I know, it all sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? But that's the way it works. So what we'd have in this case, if we connected up this circuit, is the ground here is connected to neutral and earth back on my little circuit here that then gets connected to my PC for the USB socket to come into here. And I'm thinking, hmm, I have absolutely no idea what's going on here now anymore because this is now connected to both neutral and eventually earth somewhere along the line. Who knows what this USB connection inside my PC is doing? It's undoubtedly connected to its own ground and therefore its own voltage supply. But is it going to complain about being connected to neutral? Well, quite frankly, I wasn't prepared to find out. I don't want my PC to suddenly think, no, I don't like this differential. There's, there's, it's, not, it's not the same differential here as it is here. I'm going to complain and go kaboom, and that's the end of your USB socket. So I've left it. I've said, no, we're not doing that. I'm not using this at all. I'm going to use the relay and connect, connect that motor, not to this at all. But this motor is in fact connected to a relay output, which of course is totally safe and isolated. What else could we do here? And I did mention it very briefly in the video. Well, I mentioned it whilst I was recording. Whether it ended up on the cutting room floor or not is another matter. I said, well, how do we ever get around this problem then? And of course, the answer was demonstrated in a video a while back about SSRs. A solid state relay is exactly this. It's a triac and it's driven by a gate current, except it's probably undoubtedly not like this. The triac in an SSR is somewhat different and a simplified version might be something like this. So this is the simplified circuit diagram of an SSR. You have your triac as we've drawn it here, but it's a sensitive gate in as much that it's an opto-coupled one. Okay, the gate voltage is being driven by an LED inside this package, so your Arduino can simply send its output, probably via a transistor just the same, into here and back out again to ground. So this is from your Arduino now, and that's to ground without any of this. So your Arduino is totally separated. This was covered in some detail on my video on relays a while back now. Very similar principle, opto-coupled. Now, within real life, this is a bit more complicated, and we covered that in SSRs. This photosensitive triac has probably got a zero crossing uh, detector in it as well, so this doesn't switch on mid-cycle and cause lots of interference. But apart from that, this is in principle exactly what happens. So why didn't I do that as part of my uh, heater circuit and build in an SSR? Well, the simple answer to all that was space and time. If you think that this board here managed to incorporate that triac just in one little tiny corner of the circuit without I mean, an SSR is a fairly big, chunky thing. There wouldn't have been enough space to put it, for one. Secondly, by changing this design to use an SSR was just going to take too much time. And as I say, from my point of view, controlling the swivel motor with the boost from the fan works just great for me. So it was a win-win, really. I didn't have to connect my Arduino up to the ground of the mains, I didn't have to put an SSR in and it all works just great. So moving on a little bit more now on triax, if I connect up this to the gate we've seen that the light comes on. Brilliant. And when you disconnect it, if you don't let the wires go willy-nilly, then it goes off. Great. Uh, what's the problem then with um, not running on AC for this? Right, so what I've done now then is connect up this board with a DC supply from this unit here, which Banggood kindly sent me for review. It's a 12 volt, mains in, 12 volts out, um, one amp capability, not that we're going to need anything like that. Well, having said that, actually, this is, um, that's a 2.2 watt bulb, but I was originally trying to use this thing. This is um, sort of a car indicator bulb non-LED obviously hence 
all these big fat dropping resistors, including that one there that I eventually didn't use. I tried using all this and it failed. I did certainly need uh, an ampule too for that. Everything just got far too hot. So we're using a little tiny one, so we don't need the full amp that that can give us. We'll look at this in a bit more detail in a minute. But we've powered it now with 12 volts, which is pretty much the same as what's coming out here. All right, that was 15 AC. This is 12 volts DC. RMS, that's probably about 12. So it's probably about the same, isn't it? So let's connect it up, and with any luck, the bulb should go on. And it does. So there we are. We connect it up, the gate current flows, bulb goes on. What's the problem? Oh, well, we've just discovered it, haven't we? I've disconnected the gate current, and the bulb's remaining on. Why? Well, because triax, and indeed thyristors, if you ever get to use those, which are simplified forms of triax, only switch off when the voltage at T1 or T2 drops below a very tiny minimum voltage. So by keeping the voltage on, it's latched. And the only way to switch it off now is to disconnect. And when we reconnect, of course, it stays off because we haven't passed any gate current through and the triac hasn't switched on yet. Oh, I can hear you say, just a minute, Ralph, I've got SSRs, if you're saying this is the equivalent to an SSR, that work on DC voltage, so there. And I'll say, yes, you may well have an SSR that works on DC, but it most certainly isn't a triac then, it's a MOSFET. Perhaps even two MOSFETs together, but it's a power MOSFET. It's not a triac. Triacs work on AC. And that's the fundamental difference. And in fact, for beginners, I think I think the term SSR, solid state relay, with all its variations, can be a bit of a minefield. You buy the wrong one, you could be in for a bit of a problem, couldn't you, really? So that's the fundamental difference between um, triacs, MOSFETs, and DC and AC supplies. Simple, really, but a bit of a minefield. Right, I think we'll give it a break there then. I think we've covered that in some detail. Next week... I want to go through this board here from Banggood, as I say, because this is quite a nice little board and could easily power some future Arduino projects. Um, for example, it's... No, I'm not going to tell you now. Wait until next week. Do tune in. We'll have a good go at that and uh, see what happens. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Do put your comments underneath the video, right? YouTube like that. I like it. I do respond to just about every single comment I can. And... Um, Great. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.